Hey everyone, in this episode of A Dungeon About, we go real deep into the Daggerheart rulebook that's just been released for the open playtest. After sharing our experiences with the closed playtest last episode, for this one we've actually sort of read the books. We cover the initiative system, we talk a little bit about fiction first and what that means to us and possibly to Daggerheart, and then lastly we have a long discussion about XP and leveling and reward cycles in RPGs. Throughout we're pretty crunchy and opinionated, so if you're not into that this one might not be for you. But if you're interested in Daggerheart and RPGs, I think you will enjoy this episode. Have fun! I found a bit frustrating, maybe, mm, is that they don't have like uh, an action tracker or an in initiative tracker. Yeah. Um, okay. That's good that you watched this one show because, like, uh, you want to talk about this for a bit? Yes. Because it's like definitely. Um, I mean, I also felt right. The, the the combat portion of that one show was had the most meat on its bones. Mm -hmm. I felt, uh, and now that I've sort of read the PDF, at least including the parts where there are player rules for combat and also the DM rules for combat, um, I think I understand a little bit more of what's going on mm -hmm. there. But um, so getting back to your impression, like you, you said you found you, some, some parts of it a little yeah. bit irksome. Can you be more specific? Yes. Um, so I remember when... I think that was our first ever game that we played together. Oh, um, really? the, uh, in Where we played Dungeon World. Yes, exactly. Yes. And Dungeon World also doesn't have uh, initiative. an initiative tracker. Yes. Um, and if I remember correctly, it uh, works in a way where any player can act whenever they want, basically. And um, the DM doesn't get a turn. They can only react to whatever the players do. Yeah, and the and DM then, famously never rolls dice. Yeah, Dungeon exactly. Um, and... And basically, time doesn't progress in Dungeon World if unless the <laughs> yeah it's true unless the player does something it's true yeah, uh -huh. and that even true. taking damage is just if you fail an attack roll then you take damage mm -hmm. or you have a partial success then you also take damage and you do damage it's a neat kind of system but yeah you do have this awkward a little bit of an awkward thing in Dungeon World where you as the DM can't really just attack a guy like you can't really yeah. initiate mm -hmm. combat but. I felt it works in, in Dungeon World. Like, it's uh, not a dysfunctional system. Uh, I although somewhat it might... agree. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, let me mm -hmm. uh, qualify that by saying it's also not something I would want to play all the time. It's just you might think that not having an initiative, the DM doesn't get to just attack, doesn't get to roll dice at all. That's totally dysfunctional. No, 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 no. <laughs> it does work, mm -hmm. but you may not want to do that every time, and it gives a very specific feel to the game. Yeah, uh, and I... I was a player in that campaign. Uh, I can also tell you that I was um, quite annoyed by the end of it, just because um, <laughs> being an efficient player in that system, yeah. which I want to be, um, means that uh, in that situation, I, I played it like some sort of dwarven fighter, yeah. and I had abilities to defend other people, which means that every time anybody ever failed, I had my turn. <laughs> Which so meant that I did like 60% of the fight. Right. That's what it felt like at least. Which um, might be fun w once or twice, but if that's how the game works, that might be an issue. Um, it was also, I have to say, the first time I ever... Well, not quite, but the first time I DM'd with Vincent. And yeah. let me just say <laughs> that mistakes were made, I am yeah. sure. Although my memory is hazy. Uh -huh. But um, so I'm just saying I don't know how much is at the fault of the system, but I totally right. I'm saying I wouldn't always want to play Dungeon World. I totally understand yeah. where you're so, coming from. Um, I see two problems here um, for Daggerheart, um, and one is uh, on the player side. I would have to regularly consider not only when I want to um, take part in the combat. Uh, yeah. In regards to the other players, so yeah. they have their spotlight moments and all that, um, but also how to be like uh, that is the one issue, and then the other um, part is w when do I want to act to be efficient? Yeah, 
Um, and <laughs> many... man, there were some hilarious Reddit <laughs> posts on this. But please continue. Uh-huh. I'm sure we're going to get into that. Y- yeah. Um, so, uh, is it re- resource management, or w- what kind of combat is it that's happening here? If I want to be as efficient as possible, that's the one issue that I see. Um, and the other issue I s- saw was on the DM side. Mm-hmm. Because the DM in Daggerheart does get a turn, but it's still so right? yeah, yeah. Um, but he certainly gets some sort of action, yeah. And um, it's not all; it didn't always uh, happen that way. But often, uh, Matt had to interrupt the players and s- say, "Hey, stop! This is yeah. now. This is my turn." Yeah. And um, I <laughs> does that feel like an antagonistic DM to you? <laughs> a little bit. Also, yeah. I know. Th- um, again, I'm. I'm <clears throat> I I wouldn't say I'm. A, I'm a shy pa- player, but I'm a um, a pretty. Uh, You're considerate in regards to other people's play uh, time and spotlight. Yes, and I also really like watching other people play. Yeah, and um, I feel like as a DM and also as a player, I would have issues with the system to um, know w- when. Um, I can inject myself yeah, into the action. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's something that really stood out to me. Um, yeah, uh, I think you're not the only one. I want to yeah. talk about this for for a moment. Mm-hmm. So, the first thing I want to say, uh, just because I'll, I'll forget otherwise on that last point, there's a reason why you know. I, okay, it's no secret that I'm a fan of old school D and D and basic expert and those kind of uh, versions of D and D, and uh, I really enjoyed, like as a DM, in those systems, uh, and that was sort of a revelation to me, but they have initiative not just for combat, but also for dungeon exploration, right? And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty of it, but, you know, and it doesn't matter really what the specific structure is, but there's the idea of taking dungeon turns, you know, 10-minute intervals, whatever. And within those turns, each player gets to do a thing, Right, just roughly mm-hmm. speaking, and just that, like as a DM, relieved me from uh, this whole pressure of having to track. You know, is everyone getting similar amounts of spotlight, and does er- did everybody have a chance to contribute and stuff? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. you get to ask everyone, okay, what did you do? Right, the system expects from you to do something, and so you know, mm-hmm. shyer people, people who aren't hogging the spotlight so much, they uh, uh, are encouraged to to participate. Yeah, and that uh, felt very functional and good to me. Mm-hmm. And also on the yeah. other side of the spectrum, people who <laughs> really enjoy participating and take all the spotlight for themselves, they are dialed back a little. Yeah, they which are is also um, helpful. invited to take a back seat for a moment <laughs> yeah. while other people get to do stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's just one less thing, one fewer thing to to take uh, to track as a DM, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, there is enough to track as a DM, and I believe in Daggerheart there will be there there will be quite a few things to track as a DM because mm-hmm. the combat is actually, it's sort of interesting. It's not like, they say it's a rules light game, but, you know, there's like a bunch of um, knobs to t- turn and tweak and stuff, which I actually, uh, I, I kind of like. Yeah, regarding rules light, I had, I don't know if I'd fo- call it a revelation, but um, on the way here, I read a bit more in the PDF and um, right. at some point I realized or i think they want to play a rules light game you mean the players or the designers of daggerheart now the players yeah. like uh, yeah. the, the critical role players i'm sure yeah and um which is also why i said this is like the issues i saw were issues for me as a player that i would sure. encounter i um the efficiency I saw, and stuff yeah i saw a little bit of that in the one shot i don't think it would be a big problem for that group because they enjoy improvising a lot and they are also very much um, trained in improvising and giving others the spotlight and all yeah. that. Um, but while they, I think, want a rules light game, Daggerheart doesn't quite feel like a rules light game. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is sort of, this is going to be my, my, my grand verdict on <laughs> Daggerheart so far, but, you know, uh-huh. jumping ahead a little bit. I just feel it's not quite, it doesn't have a finished identity yet. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know what I mean? It's just, 
doesn't quite know what it wants to be yet. That's just the yeah. image I get. I uh, now I'm really doing it, like cubing the <laughs> whole. Pretty. I feel it's a um, it has a really well designed, interesting um, sort of player character ch chassis. You know what I mean? Like a framework to build characters and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, those rules feel robust and well designed. Uh, and it also, I think, uh, after being really critical about it last week, I now actually feel that whole fear and the turn trading between players and the DM, which I think we'll get a little bit more into in a moment. Um, I find that super interesting, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that my problems from last week where I thought, oh, this might be too antagonistic with the DM. It feels lame when the DM can just spend tokens to introduce um, monsters and stuff w in the middle of a fight. Mm -hmm. Those may be pseudo problems or problems that are easily fixable. After, you know, I, I I think that now after having read the DM chapter and like yeah. seeing the DM moves and stuff, all that stuff feels super interesting and fresh. And this whole, I, I'm, it might still be shit. I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I have to try it out, but I'm really hopeful <laughs> and interested in like, you know, trying out this initiative system mm -hmm. of, of trading. Because it's not like Dungeon World, right? It's not completely freeform because whenever people roll fear, the players, it's you are as the DM, you're supposed to take a turn, basically. They don't call it that, except sometimes when they do. <laughs> Uh -huh. But I mean, yeah, that's yeah. all wording. They still, yeah, you know, yeah. they it's say unedited. at the start, yeah. uh -huh. it, they still haven't had an editor pass yeah. over the document and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, but but those things feel really strong. But then when it comes to all the stuff around that, I feel like the document as it is falls apart a little bit. J just in like giving me a coherent, creative vision that I feel they're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's my biggest issue. I just read the text and I don't quite get a strong vision. I gave my big verdict. Um, <laughs> yes. I do want to talk about, uh, get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the mm -hmm. initiative thing, if you agree. Um, yes, please. please. So, but be, so before we do that, I feel like maybe we can uh, just d d talk about what actually is the initiative, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're on the same page and potential listeners also know what we're talking about. Yeah, because I, I didn't quite get to reading that. I sure, just... Vincent didn't do his homework. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's okay. I also didn't read the whole thing, but the DM stuff, I was super interested in this. Mm -hmm. So the way I understand it in Daggerheart, um, it, the game is freeform and, you know, the D DM calls for roles whenever they're appropriate and dramatic and stuff. Um, but then you might enter a combat uh, and com you can resolve combat in the exact same way you do the rest of the game but the uh, at his discretion or her discretion the dm may introduce what is called i think an action tracker and once mm -hmm. you do that we still don't have traditional in initiative that's not what it is but um well you place i guess the action tracker on the table and then uh when a PC does something, which is the default, uh, right? They might attack an enemy or whatever. Yeah. Uh, then they place a token on the action tracker. Mm -hmm. And that's just an arbitrary PC token. They use these all the time. It's just a, uh, just to keep count, an arbitrary count in the action tracker. Yeah. Uh, and the PCs get to do this in whatever order they like and as often as they like placing tokens on the tracker until one of them fails a roll or rolls with fear, right? Mm -hmm. The fear die comes up higher. And then the DM uh, action sort of goes to the DM. They don't call it a turn, but that's sort of what it is. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes they do call it a turn. So once you get a failure or fear, the DM gets to take a turn and the DM then has to use the tokens on the tracker to activate uh, various NPCs he might have in the battle uh, or sometimes groups of adversaries. And there are, you know, th then it gets very interesting to me because there's a lot of, you know, nitty gritty there. You can convert those tokens into fear on a two to one uh, basis, mm -hmm. right? And also the other way, you can spend a fear, you know, to if you don't have enough tokens on the table to generate two tokens and place them on the 
tracker. Okay. Uh, so there's a conversion between tokens and fear, right? Yeah. Uh, which also, if you have a lot of fear banked up as a DM, you can basically, mm -hmm. once it's your turn in a fight, you can really <laughs> just vomit <laughs> forth a bunch of tokens and just go to town uh -huh. on the players, yeah. I guess. Um, you know, it, interesting how that's going to turn out. And mm -hmm. of course, you can do other stuff with your your fear resource, all the DM moves and so on. You can end conditions on um, monstrous temporary conditions, other if negative sure. effects and mm -hmm. stuff. You can add damage. And also, and that, that's the thing. That's why I'm not so hard on this anymore. It's just one in a long list. Uh, you can also introduce new adversaries into the fight. Mm -hmm. But that's... And, and then you're supposed to do that. And w when it's the player's turn again, is sort of up to you, I guess. <laughs> Because okay. the DM doesn't roll duality dice. The DM rolls with a d20, and so, mm -hmm. you know, fear will not come up for you. I guess you might pass the, I'm going to say, initiative back to the players when you fail a roll. You, that can still happen. Okay. Um, but other than that, I mean, you might just run out of tokens, right? And then it yeah, naturally that... goes back to the players. Mm -hmm. That and was that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and that's that would be the default <clears throat> I would do as a DM. But you see why I'm curious about it? Because I feel like <laughs> I would just TPK my party in the first round or whatever. If, if you can. Yeah. If I can. And that needs to... I, I have no idea. I didn't go that deep into I mean, the mechanics. Okay, now that I think about it. Um, so if I understand you correctly... Um, the DM gets a turn when you fail a roll or roll with fear. Yes. So um, there's a little star there, but please continue. Mm -hmm. So once he gets resources, he gets his turn. Right. Mm -hmm. Once he gets fear, he gets his turn. Mm, that's not quite correct because he might already have fear, which you can convert to tokens at any okay. point. Sure. Uh, and I think what the game says is the DM gets his turn when mm -hmm. players fail or roll with fear. Or, and that's the little star, whenever he wants <laughs> or she wants. Yeah, yeah okay. Which is, so, that's a, mm -hmm. it's endemic in the entire PDF, mm -hmm. this sort of being non-committal and stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, would a normal combat um, look either um, like the players just demolishing the encounter and right rolling a couple of times or multiple times with hope or and just succeeding. Right. And then um, once the DM gets their turn, their power is already significantly re uh, reduced. Um, mm -hmm. Or the other option is the players fail, um, hopefully early, and then the uh, DM just doesn't have a lot of resources to spend. Right. Of, of course, they might have resources from before the fight, the DM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but these are the, like the, the two. And then, well, then he would have to wait for the players to do a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then at least he gets tokens. And presumably he will get at least one fear. Well, maybe. He might not. Yeah, but, yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking specifically about how would you um, TPK your party. Right. right. The, yeah, the, yeah. the two yeah. options if I see. If you want to be a dick and dagger hard, <laughs> here's how to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking at it from the other perspective. How. Yeah, yeah. how how is that even possible, basically? Yeah, I is like it, this exploration. Uh, is is this um, just from this, the setup of the system, is is this impossible? Either by you having not enough resources to spend, because uh, your turn happens early, or by you not having enough uh, actors in the fight? Well, I mean, you can just wait. Here's how I would do it, right? If mm -hmm. I wanted to TPK my party, I would definitely wait and and just sort of role play and muck about <laughs> until I have, like, just, uh -huh. oh, you're on the tavern. Let's, you know, yeah. throw some darts at mm -hmm. the wall and sure. stuff. And then yeah. the moment you have 10 fear, you say, yeah. okay, orcs attack. Uh -huh. Orcs attack the tavern. Get, yeah. get ready. I mean, no, uh -huh. no, don't roll for initiative. We don't have initiative. <laughs> do your thing and then wait till they, you know, fail mm -hmm. a roll inevitably. Uh, and then just unleash on the party and hopefully, you know, bring down the I mean, first person. And then I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe that doesn't work for reasons that I don't anticipate yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm just... Th then you have the maximum amount of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, here's a... This is going to sort of a different topic, but yeah. we're kind of talking about combat, so it's related. Last time we also talked about damage thresholds and stuff, right? Yeah. And also just to reiterate how it actually, I think, works... Uh, is, okay, I as the DM attack your player character, 
I roll a d20, have to beat your evasion. Mm -hmm. If I do, I get to roll damage, which is something like 2d8 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that has to then pass a certain damage threshold, minor, major, or severe. Uh, let's say 12, and that's your major threshold. Uh, uh, and then you get to choose mm -hmm. uh, to, to whether or not you want to spend a, an armor slot if you have one. And then if you do, you will deduce your armor value from the damage which I rolled, which may change the threshold. And then if it stays at major, for instance, you would take, at that point, take 2 HP. Mm. Okay. And this is different. Last time I think I said you roll armor dice. So it's, it's actually a little bit more simple. There's no armor dice, it's just an armor value. You still have to subtract and it's an extra step. But no rolling, except when there is, because sometimes you do get armor <laughs> dice. Yeah. Also, like I, watching it, uh, I, I still maintain my position that this is just too many steps, and especially the step where the player has to make a decision before the combat can continue is an issue. It might, yeah, it might become a bit tedious and too long and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I was going to bring it up right now, though, because um, I'm still kind of excited about it. I still find it interesting because one of the things um, which I noticed going even just through the basic abilities mm -hmm. of level one characters, many of them have like, you know, I, I thought this was broken, but I think it's not broken. <laughs> They have really explosive and like you know, uh, disastrously scaling damage values sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, like, th the rogue can, like, stack a bunch of sneak attack and get other sources for extra dice and stuff. The sorcerer can, like, sacrifice one of his domain cards to, like, boost a spell attack and magic missile and stuff and push a lot of damage. But all that stuff is, I think, totally fine mm -hmm. because of the damage thresholds, right? Because all you're ever going to get out of it, of really exploding damage, uh, is to cross the severe threshold and it doesn't go beyond mm. that. Mm -hmm. There's an optional rule where you have a fourth threshold if you hit twice the severe threshold, and then it does four HP, but that's, it's still limited, right? Uh, and that's actually kind of interesting. That's a really cool effect of having damage thresholds, I feel, because now as a designer, you don't have to worry about exploding damage, uh, but as a player, you now have this interesting tactical choice of how many resources do I want to spend on damage? The answer is probably not all, because at some point, you know, there's diminishing returns. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I think so. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if, the, uh -huh. you, you know, if let's say you get to spend hope, uh, I'm making this up now, let's say you spend one hope for one extra D8 of mm -hmm. damage. Yeah. Uh, at some point you want to stop, you know, boosting your damage roll with D8s because they will not help you cross yeah. another threshold. Mm -hmm. And then you're just wasting hope. Uh, and that's, you know, it's an interesting way to um, sort of do resources and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's also... Um why i like the system the the whole um level of severity and um, yeah. ha having thresholds seems like a good system to me um, i haven't actually played it but um i like the idea it's just yeah. mostly um slowing the combat down even further which i mean combat already and dnd for example takes up a lot of time It does. And uh, yeah, in D&D &D 5, in my opinion, for my taste, it takes up too much time, mm -hmm. at least the way we play it. Um, I mean, and we're not that, we're not that slow. No, we're not. But we are efficient. Right. And that's yeah. the thing. Other people, if you don't <laughs> care about that stuff, which I, yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who aren't mm -hmm. uh, intense nerds like us. And, you know, um, then maybe it doesn't take that long. I don't know. Yeah, but it's not a uh, that's not an uncommon complaint about the fifth edition. Yeah, and here I, I just had the feeling that um, the whole questioning the players whether they want to use an armor slot or not slows it down even more. Yeah, but also uh, um, another uh, yeah. thing I noticed the whole uh, tag team action. Yeah, that's interesting. Right? Um, I I think they <laughs> included it because uh, they did it a few times in at least campaign two uh, with. Mm -hmm. You watched campaign two, right? With uh, I did, yeah, um, I liked do, it. Do you remember? Uh, was it Fluffernutter? Yeah, the Fluffernutter, yeah. which uh, Sam kept wanting to like. It was a big mm -hmm. bomb, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is also I didn't know that, but that actually that's a word. 
Oh yeah? Yeah. I didn't know that either. What does it mean? It's like some it's like s- old English. <laughs> no, it's um I, I think it's some kind of not pastry but some sweet with oh. a marshmallow and chocolate or something oh. like that. Yeah. I I was surprised. It's, so it's a out. calorie bomb. Uh, yes, basically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um yeah, I, I think that's where they uh, found that. Um I found it very interesting that uh, basically, one party says they want to do a tag team action, and yeah. they spend the hope, and then they explain what the tag team action is with, without the, yeah. the other uh, character being really involved up until that point. Yeah, they have to agree to do it. Sh- sure. Yeah. But it's a really smart move. Uh, the way, At least the way I r- read it, it's very effective. I mm-hmm. think you even have to spend two or even three hope to do it as the oh, initiator. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the way I read it, uh, y- both of you then roll your normal mm-hmm. duality dice and you uh, as the, pl- I guess you have, you two have to decide, but you two get to decide which of the roles will be the one taken. So it's like mega advantage because yeah. presumably you can still have advantage on those individual roles, mm-hmm. which in Daggerheart means you add a D6. Uh, but this is really cool because obviously th- th- the and way that- I read it, it interacts with hope and fear, right? So you can mm-hmm. basically guarantee to get a hope for both players on that role, right? So it's usually yes. a net a net gain of hope or at least you break even um, for the, the party. Well, if you spend three hope, then yeah, if it's not, three, but even then, um, take criticals into account. <laughs> We're already uh, cracking the code. Uh, but it's also interesting because then you add um, if if you actually hit with your action, mm-hmm. um, you add the damage dice of both attacks together, which is a lot of damage. Yeah, but again, then you all you do is cross the severe threshold, right? Yeah, but it also if if you encounter an enemy that has uh, a very tough yes. hide yeah. and it's difficult to crack, um, well, then there you, you tag go. team it, mm-hmm. which is super cool. I see what they're going for, and I think it works, right? You have some kind of colossus enemy, and then you can describe how okay, I like throw mm-hmm. my goblin companion up on the colossus's shoulders and stuff, and we climb this thing, and then we bring it down, and that's a total tag team move, right? Yeah, it's just like my only problem with that. Is I I like the concept totally. I just I'm missing a bit of the fantasy there, um, the the in world explanation, um, yeah. because <laughs> what you just said. I'm throwing my goblin companion on the giant. Yeah, the goblin companion has to say yes, <laughs> but that's it. Like there's no real planning involved or anything, um, and I I don't know how to fix that problem. I, maybe um, you you have to uh, have an idea before the fight or set up. A training session or something like that. I don't know, um, but it felt weird the one time they used it because one of the players uh, told the other player, "Okay, we're doing this," yeah. and he said yes, and uh, it was a complicated maneuver. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> the mechanics don't manage to evoke that kind of fiction, right? Of like two highly skilled combatants doing like a move that they practice together or something. Yeah. This is a, I think, a deep problem with this system <laughs> and with the other ones. That, really? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh-huh. you want to keep talking about Daggerheart? Yeah. Because this might open another can of worms. Mm-hmm. But um, the Daggerheart rules say at various points, I, th- I they might not use this exact language, although they, th- I think they do, but they use uh, very similar language. They, they say that the game is fiction first and narrative focused. Mm-hmm. Right? You would agree. Yeah. Um, so, if I when I looked at the example play, which is in the rules, it's a, a little segment, like, you know, quite economical, uh, that, that just gives you a transcript, basically, of a fictional play session, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I looked at that, I thought, um, oh, this is not fiction first. <laughs> this is... What I would call um, a button push play, because <laughs> oh, do you okay. know what I mean by that? Well, I I, I think 
I know what you mean by that, but I don't know the actual example. So sure. do you have any idea where that is in the book? Um, it's somewhere between part two and three. might be at the end of the player chapter. Um, example of it, yeah. It. Yeah, I mean, we can't read it now. It's no, a bit yeah, long, just but have it open. Like, so I'm, I have to give an example now for the button push plate thing. And mm -hmm. I think this thing starts with them having to go to, to some tower because another adventuring group met skeletons there and they died and stuff. Uh, and that's all fine. But then I think they have to find the tower. And then the example says, okay, the druid uses his, like, nature's call ability to talk to a goat or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so w the impression I immediately get from that example alone is that, okay, Daggerheart wants the DM to present players with problems that they then solve with their character sheet. Uh -huh. And that's totally fine. It's what I want to do in a game, right? <laughs> yes. But to me, though, there is a uh, so this is a an ultimately subjective and cognitive category, right? This is about how do human beings you play with sort of think about the game, what's going on in their head, mm -hmm. and I find that role playing games are more satisfying when people really sort of envision the uh, fictional space they're in and they really almost feel it in their bodies. I guess that's a very hippie way to put it, but it's like, <laughs> you know, they, they, they really can envision standing in front of this mountain or whatever and looking for that tower and what it's like, and then they think about what would their character do. That's kind of obvious, right? That's what we want from a role-playing mm -hmm. game, right? And the problem that sometimes can happen, especially in games that give players lots of abilities with, like, names and stuff and yeah. stuff on their character sheet, is that they that players just look at their character sheet and kind of start to play it like a video game where they just look for the right button to press, mm -hmm. right? That's on their character sheet. And I, I'm really torn because I, I'm not on principle against that, right? Because I also think that's fun, right? And yeah. I like video games and stuff. I just noticed that it's almost like 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 poison that needs the right dosage and it's like a fun <laughs> drug if you yeah. give a little bit of it and it makes everything better and more exciting but there's a point where it becomes too much and then the game uh, no longer manages to really get people to simulate mm -hmm. the fiction in their head right and really feel like they're there and think about what's going on and this example i have to say um kind of felt like i'm not really there in the fiction can you I think I know what you mean, but can you give an example of an actual fiction first RPG? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that and I thought about it and now I uh -huh. forgot. Uh, <laughs> huh. Oh, no. Um, is it one we've played? No, I mean, there's. Uh, oh, yeah, the question is what is. Um, so, uh, okay, I, I think that it's difficult to actually write a an RPG that is fiction first, right? Mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, sure. What I just said, it's subjective. It's a cognitive category. It's almost impossible for you as a game designer to force people to play your game fiction first, right? But, yeah. oh, oh, I'm sure you saw this coming. Marius likes the OSR. But <laughs> all the OSR yeah. games, like the BX and Stars Without Number and so on, mm -hmm. um, th they famously give player characters very little actual options on their character sheet. So that that alone kind of forces you to think about what to do in the game, right? And because, mm. for instance, mm -hmm. there's no button for you to push to, like, tag team climb a Colossus. Uh, and so, well, that's just something y you have to describe and kind of do in the game, right? Yeah. Okay. I actually, that's not the best example <clears throat> for Figure First. Yeah, I'm sure one will come to me. Let me tell you um, another game we've played and talked about before is burning wheel sure and um <laughs> yes, also one i like yes uh same um and while, while that certainly has a lot of character sheet and a lot of abilities yeah in, in some regards um as a player it always felt fiction first to me because um you get s you spend so much time envisioning your character uh-huh that your character sheet becomes sort of just a tool you use at some, at some point when it is called for. Yeah. And most of the time you are lost in your own character. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't, I mean, I, 
sometimes you have abilities uh, if you're playing some sort of wizard um, maybe but most of the time you you just um, describe what your character would do because they are really mostly just humans yeah um, and we all know what humans can do well I, I, I let me interject a little bit just mm -hmm. so people know what we're talking about if you don't know burning wheel yes, it's do. actually it's an interesting example because you might think it totally leads to button push play because the kind of character sheet you'll end up with <laughs> will have millions of skills and each one they're uh -huh. like carpentry illuminations mm -hmm. uh persuasion uh horse riding like all kinds of shit not just yeah. combat stuff like all kinds of stuff you would have in an actual medieval society, yeah. the kind they're, that in, in Bernie the book, wants to model. They're like, I don't know, 40 400, pages yeah, yeah. of just skills. It's yeah, incredible. It's like 400 plus skills. Yeah, like and they, you have like yeah. at, at least 12 skills for talking alone, yeah. depending on how the mood in the room is. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I'm not saying I've cracked the code for fiction first, right? I Because mm -hmm. I feel the same way about Burning Wheel, but I, like, I also feel it's, it manages to maintain fiction first. Yeah. Um, it, it may be that Burning Wheel has figured out to give you the poison, but to also slip you the antidote as well. <laughs> uh, you know Maybe. what I mean? Because Burning yeah. Wheel does a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. that's designed to keep you in character. So here's a <laughs> fiction first example. Are we still in the podcast? I don't know. What day is well, it? Well, <laughs> we were, and then we weren't, and then we... <laughs> that's how it works now <laughs> yeah um so here's a fiction first example i feel anyway from like D D. and yes this was from us playing basic expert and osr and it's a very classic example right it's um the party is deep in a dungeon and mm -hmm. once they've already had some hardship a fireball has been thrown at the party and you're like 12 people plus two donkeys or whatever oh, God. and lots of treasure already but the players are still greedy <laughs> and they know if they cross a chasm to go deeper into the uh -huh. dungeon there's gonna be more right and now they decide to uh throw a rope over the chasm and climb over it mm -hmm to not use more time to build a bridge or whatever. And there, um, I feel that in Daggerheart, what the example often wants you to do is then just do everything with a button that they push, an agility roll or whatever, and then maybe fail the roll and then give them complications or whatever. You mm -hmm. fall, you take d6 damage, whatever. And fiction first means to me... And means in this example to me that a lot of the consequences of doing that, you know, that choice by the players to cross that chasm wasn't in some failed role of climbing or whatever. Mm. I think there was that as well, but the, the that was sort of easily resolvable. The, the big consequences were purely fictional, namely by leaving donkeys behind and, you know, being in a disadvantageous state you know where you cannot easily flee anymore and you're yeah. like delving deeper into to the dungeon and you're using various resources healing time um equipment and all that mm -hmm. stuff so right but that's all none of that is a button you push or like a role you make and stuff but it's still it's part of the fiction right do you know what I mean? It, yes. I I kind of disagree on the equipment because that's definitely on the character sheet, but I totally agree on um, having yeah. the, the in-fiction complication that, yeah, now you're deeper in the dungeon and the only way to get out is climbing back through uh, over that rope and that, that takes time and it's not a easy way to escape. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I agree the rope using that, that's much more buttony. Yeah. But it's all these, what I'm trying to get at is that there's a lot of soft factors that um, uh, factor into uh, sort of making tension in the fiction and mm -hmm. stuff, right? And it's not always coming from one role. But yeah. it's just, I'm trying to get a handle on this. What What is this fiction first thing? And, um, but you know, it's it's yeah. an ongoing discussion. I don't have all the answers. But it's just, it's something I noticed in Daggerheart. I think it's something that the system is honestly struggling with a little bit. Mm -hmm. Also with this whole, what is my identity? Because it's also, okay. it's fine to not be fiction first, right? If yeah. you just want to make a cool fourth edition-esque, uh, like um, set piece, wow, raid encounter simulator, that might mm -hmm. be very cool, <laughs> right? I might play that. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, <clears throat> I um <laughs> I, I keep coming back to that, but I think the critical role people 
want to play the game they are describing here, mm -hmm. but are hanging on to D and D. Yeah. yeah, and I, um, I would really like to see them play the game they want to uh, want to play. Actually, and this feels like it's sort of half-hearted for the moment, at least. Yeah, um. and also um, in regards to. Uh, collaborative and all that um i read at the the beginning of the pdf it, uh the the game talks a lot about uh collaborating to build the story to yeah. build the setting and all that um d does the game ever like help you with that um because for example well, in, in dungeon world it definitely does right it gives, gives you, you tools the, yeah it gives us tools to say okay um If you want, uh, you, you can say, if you get to a new city, for example, you can say, uh, hey, I know somebody here, and then this is the role you have to do. Yeah, that's just and about lore move, right? We talked about exactly. that Exactly, and week. you, you yeah. can just make up stuff about the world, and um, then you roll to see if that actually is how it is, or if that's not how it is, or yeah. if that's kind of what it is. And, and, and here's the, the good version of button push play, right? That's the thing, <laughs> I'm not totally against it, uh -huh. but the the... the Spout lore is a move in Dungeon World. The mm -hmm. advan and that's a button you can push, right? And yeah. the advantage of having buttons on your character sheet to push is that, you know, new players to an RPG, just seeing that on their character sheet might give them the idea, oh, that's actually something I can do in this game. Mm -hmm. I could just claim that all goblins have wings and see what happens and stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, if that's true or not. And, you know, that might not occur to you otherwise unless that's on your character sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think or I don't quite see as many options for Daggerheart to do that kind of thing. Yeah, right? that's just another sort of... Um, yeah. The game doesn't quite uh, resonate with what it actually wants to be situation. It's just, yeah, it, it tells you, hey, we want collaborate storytelling, yeah. uh, collaborative storytelling, um, but then it doesn't give you a lot to do that, actually. Yeah. Um, and it also... Still not totally sure about that, but I feel like it puts a lot of pressure on the GM. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, but for, that, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I really need to play Daggerheart and need yeah. to DM it uh -huh. because I envision feeling overwhelmed, um, but it might not mm -hmm. be true. It has to be tr Maybe, tried yeah. out. And um, yeah, the DM, uh, the, the game doesn't really give you lots of tools to manage stuff. The question with any RPG um, and other stuff as well, but let's stick to RPGs, is always what does the game tell you what that it's about mm -hmm. uh, and what are the mechanics actually about? Yeah. Right? Then that, that, to me that that's that's a real litmus test, right? That's mm -hmm. you know, is it that's the question is it properly designed? Um, and you know, a famous example, a game which I kind of love, would love to play one day, probably the newest version doesn't do this, but older versions of Vampire the Masquerade definitely did this, where the game would tell you that it's a really, you know, deep sort of romance vampire novel about questions of... Uh, humanity and mm -hmm. like when will you lose your humanity and stuff yeah is it worth giving it up for immortality those kinds of questions and that it's very sort of theatrical but then when you look at the mechanics yeah actually it's a game about superhero combat with rocket launchers and fangs fuck yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is cool in its uh -huh. own way but just not what the game tells you there's a discrepancy there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I think uh -huh. the newest version might might be a lot better on that. But Maybe. that's a thing that definitely happens with RPG. And I feel like Daggerheart is a little bit suffering from that kind of syndrome. Mm -hmm. One with being fiction first, but then also, and in my mind, that's a different thing. That might also be the thing. Maybe they need to actually define at some point what do they mean by fiction, right? What do they mean by narrative? Mm -hmm. Maybe we just have different interpretations of those terms. Um, but but they, the, the other thing they say is it's narrative-focused, right? Mm -hmm. And there is the question, what does that mean to to them? Because I, oh, that's maybe what you were getting at. I feel like um, it keeps saying that, but it doesn't actually give you a lot of tools to craft a satisfying narrative. 
right? And like it also, it will say mm. stuff like, oh, this is about, you know, downtime is about deep emotional moments and stuff. But like, mm -hmm. maybe I don't know, maybe I'm not a writer. Maybe I don't know how to produce an emotional moment, right? They kind of, that's what I expect from the game mechanics to give me mechanics that will facilitate those kinds of emotions that the game says that is about. And hopefully they're sort of intense and make us feel stuff, right? Yeah. And that's an easy example. This this might not be very deep, right? But like classic D&D, you know, the premise is go in a dungeon, get treasure. Well, whenever I go in and I get that treasure, I'm going to feel an emotion. I'm going to feel good. I'm mm -hmm. going to feel success, right? Yeah. And that's not very deep, but... <laughs> that is something that those, you know, the game promises that and the, the mechanics deliver that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the other more heady example is, we talked about it bef just now before, uh, Burning Wheel, right? That gives you tools to create story, right? Yeah. In the, in the form of beliefs, right? Because mm -hmm. the way Burning Wheel interprets it, I think story is uh, when... A, a, a character wants something and there's an obstacle to that thing and then they struggle a bit and then they either get it or they don't. And when mm -hmm. that happens, you have drama, you have story, right? And yeah, and the, you get rewarded for it. You do. The game, make, oh man, that's, oh, we're <laughs> never going to get out of here. But that'll be, I think, the last thing I want to talk about, at least uh -huh. for today, uh, the whole reward thing. But th that, yeah, the beliefs, they give the player some tools to actually facilitate uh, story happening. Right, because mm -hmm. they you literally have to make you know, formulate something you want, and then the game will instruct the DM to give you obstacles, and then those things come together and story happens. Yeah, uh, but Daggerheart doesn't quite do that. Not mm -hmm. that I see anyway. No. Yeah. I just um, I I'm looking at the downtime thing right now, and um, mm -hmm. I like how uh, so the exact quote is uh, though this is time. Uh, Though this is their time to recover from the dangers they faced, it's also an ideal opportunity for characters to have important emotional yeah. scenes with each other. I pasted that exact thing in my notes for mm -hmm. this example. <clears throat> you found it. Uh, to learn more about one another and have character, etc. And then um, the downtime time activities are short rest and long rest. Yeah. And I just re read through them all. And yeah. at no point... Um, <laughs> is an ally mentioned? Actually, yes, there is. You can the help each other. There's... Repair armor, you may yeah. also do this to an ally's armor instead. Yeah. Um, but all the options are like, okay, heal hit points, heal stress, repair armor, uh, prepare for the journey, get hope. Mm -hmm. So very, very um, inside of the whole player mechanic sphere. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, and okay. how, how does this help me make an emotional scene? Right? Yeah. And even if, like, prepare and work on a project um, it, it do help invoke some sort of scene that could be interesting yeah um, but it's, it's very um light i would say i mean i i like the downtime system i don't have any real problem with it um i, no, I think me mechanically, it works. mechanically, yeah, mechanically yeah. it's fine it's, it's just, just that it doesn't do what it says it wants to do right y yeah so maybe they should just scrap all talk about <laughs> emotions and narrative <laughs> and, and no, then actually, i'll be satisfied <clears throat> Okay, here's the last thing I wanted to talk about, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's a big thing and an important thing. And it actually, when I read it, uh, I almost feel, felt a little bit disheartened because I know that Ooh. this uh, breaks the game's neck for me, at least. Oh, Other no. people may feel completely different. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, there may be a later chapter that clarifies this. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think so, because I read, um, at least in the player section, it talks about advancement, right? How do you level up? The mm -hmm. game has levels, and I think the actual leveling up looks pretty fun, the kind of options you get. I liked all that stuff. Uh, but the question is, where do you get levels? Other games have XP and stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, there's various ways to go about that. Uh, but you need some kind of reward cycle, right? That's the idea in these games. It's, it's a, there's a basic reward cycle, uh, and I pursue the reward, and when I get it, it will usually um, broaden my cone of possibilities in the game, right? I get yes. more abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones I have grow stronger. 
Sometimes it might even just be you get more money, right? More resources in a game. Yeah. More loot, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it Castles. all... Castles. <laughs> Wait, what did you just say? Castles. You might get castles. Yes. I mean, you know, uh -huh. I'm not going to go into the round of our classic D&D <laughs> &D and strongholds and stuff. That's for another day. I mean, but they... I, they Got a castle in campaign one. That's true. I mean, it is the classic D&D &D trope, but yeah. it's cool as fuck, in my mm -hmm. opinion. But yeah. So it's just stuff that makes you more powerful, right? And we yeah. naturally crave that and want that. Mm -hmm. And that's super cool. Um, and now the question is, what is the reward cycle in Daggerheart? And the way I understand it is, well, you play the game a bit, and whenever the DM feels like it, you get a level up. <laughs> oh, no. And that... <laughs> Doesn't is work that, for me. I can just, just say that. Wait, is that just milestones? It or is, is that... milestone. Though, let okay, let's let's be a bit nuanced about this, right? Mm -hmm. Because what does milestone mean to you, right? That can mean a, a variety of things to different people. Yeah, I'm actually not even exactly sure how milestones work in D and D. Like, when do yeah. you get one? Is that clarified by mm -hmm. the DM before it happens, or? Is the DM just... I know that Mercer was pretty much just telling yeah. the people, okay, and you level up now. Yeah. By the way, that's perfect for that table. I think yeah. they're happy with I it, and I'm uh -huh. happy with them being happy with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, is but, that how it yeah. works? So your question, does DMD say that, D&D &D say that, 5th yeah. edition? Yeah, probably, but nobody ever reads the DM's guide, so Fair. nobody knows. Because <laughs> that's where that's it. That's, uh -huh. why they, that's a really good book, that DM guide. It has loads of stuff in there and like hacking options for 5th edition, but nobody yeah. knows about it because nobody ever reads it. Well, And they I, also mm. structured it slightly weirdly, but yeah. that's neither here nor there. The I, point is, I think they leave it a little bit open what a milestone is. Okay, but is it clarified to the players before it happens? Do you know? I th uh, so Because that would be... Very important to me as a player because yeah, that's me too. my main yeah. motivator. Exactly. That's what you want to work towards, yeah. right? That gets you excited about showing up tonight. Oh, we're going to do that and that, and then I'll probably get a level, right? Mm -hmm. Every, I think everyone understands that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you're like me, you want a measure of control over that process. Yeah, and it also it might impact your decision-making in the, the yeah, game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like the, the prime example is monster XP versus gold. Yeah. Right? If, if I see a treasure... Gold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if I see a treasure and I know that X is XP, then I will try to get it. Yeah. Um, if I see a treasure and a monster, I might just kill the monster or ignore the monster, depending on or uh, work around the monster, depending on if it's worth XP. Yeah, and if you're really like that, that disincentivizes fighting, right? Yeah. Because there's no if you don't get XP for killing monsters, mm -hmm. why even fight? If you can sneak around and grab the treasure, good for you. Yeah. And okay, that's unsurprisingly that's a playstyle which I love, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's a good example, right, for a functioning reward loop and how that influences your choices and stuff. And to your question again, how does Fifth Edition want it? Uh, the answer, the short answer is I don't know, but of course that does not keep me from speculating <laughs> because that's what we do here. Yeah. And the <laughs> way the impression I get is that it's adventure dependent, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an it's still not something I super like, but I can totally live with that. It's I I can envision that that you let's say you have an adventure that's like mission based or whatever yeah. and you can pick different missions and then it just says from the get go okay whenever you finish a mission successfully you get a level up okay uh, that's sort of very oh, okay. coarse grained for a reward cycle but I can totally live with that right mm -hmm. uh, because now there are stakes I can either succeed on the mission or not and I also know when is what I'm doing in the game progressing me towards a level up right okay whenever i do stuff that's useful for the mission yeah. that will shape play mm -hmm. and that would that would be one way to do milestone right yeah uh, and but now daggerheart literally at least from what i've read i can read it to you <laughs> oh, yeah um, you got it there please do because uh, in my opinion I, this is central to an rpg i agree that is my mo main motivator yeah. apart from doing cool stuff and uh, they, like, all that friends meeting yeah, talking oh, bullshit yeah. uh, that's not why we play games we play to win uh, when a party has accomplished something of significance in a campaign the GM may tell them that it is time to level up how often this happens is up to your GM and your group's narrative preferences but most groups play at least three sessions or many more in between each time they level up yeah and then it keeps going about levels and stuff so, yeah, it's up to the GM. That also seems wildly off the charts. I didn't even notice that. But would you play Daggerheart for three sessions and then only in the fourth session you get level two? That seems like way too long. 
Uh, I I don't know honestly. I I know that that would be an issue in D and D, but I don't know how strong or weak or uh, interesting level one characters are in. They sure, um, I just so feel it might be fine. Now, yeah, I mean, I hey, we talk, talked about burning wheel. Do you know how long it took me to level any skill beyond five? That's true, but that's a uh, it's yeah, apples. Yeah, <laughs> that's apples and oranges because the burning wheel has a totally different reward cycle, and like the immediate reward is the beliefs and persona and stuff. Right? Yeah, do you know how long it took me to get deed? Well, yeah, that's I'm like sorry. the no, no, no. How long does no, okay? Let's not go into burning wheel stuff. This, we can have uh -huh. one day. Okay, we we'll just have one whole a whole episode where we just gush over burning wheel. Okay, and we can all we can save it for that yeah, one. Fair. Um, but I'm I'm all I'm saying is that in D and D yes. that would annoy me. But I don't know how Daggerheart plays, so I have no idea how long would feel right in that game look i'm f cool with like being a hard ass about it and making people work for their reward i think mm -hmm. that can be more satisfying but i also just know how uh, sort of the entire gaming landscape has developed over the last 20 years and people are i think used to a little bit more instant gratification right they they want to get a little bit more like more uh, feedback a little bit more quickly on you know how they're doing progress wise maybe but we also like we play D and D at level five six yeah takes a while to level up yeah but you don't always like do you know what I mean fifth edition starts you off and you need like one goblin fight and you level up like three hundred XP like yeah it's designed in this way where the first couple levels are like you know you level up once per session basically true but at some point we started playing from level three yeah that's true Be <laughs> good point <laughs> because that was sort of pointlessly fast those yeah. first three levels uh -huh. lots of people do that yeah so i mean i'm on your side right i, I like it i just wonder oh wow would other people like that playing yeah. three sessions until level two i don't no, know I do. but that's now we're in the weeds with fine tuning the bigger mm -hmm. issue is in my opinion okay the dm gets to just decide and again it's just the the game kind of just leaving it to you to come up with a good reward cycle yeah right it's just putting it on the shoulder mm -hmm. of the dm yeah it's just it's, it's undesigned in my opinion sorry yeah and specifically n not telling the players <laughs> right yeah it's yeah just, um, the dm may if <laughs> if they choose yeah and it's um as a player i really want to know uh, yeah. what do i need to do here to uh, get xp to level up to do whatever and um at no point in this, at least in this little passage that I've read, uh, does it say anything about players, <laughs> basically. No. Apart from your group's narrative preferences, which I, I don't even really know what that means. Yeah, they, they keep having phrases like that in there. And yeah, it may, what I said earlier might be really useful. Like, actually tell us what you mean by a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but... Um, I mean, th okay, there are other ways to reward players, right? I thought sure. about this. I wanted to give Daggerheart a fair shot because maybe levels just aren't important to them and it's loot and equipment and money and stuff mm -hmm. that rewards you. But I don't see it. First of all, because <laughs> the money system is hilarious. Like, did you look at it? No. Because they... At first, I thought they were just abstracting it, which I'm totally fine with. That makes uh -huh. it easier for the DM and stuff, right? Sure, and they have yeah. these terms like fistfuls of gold and like bags of gold and tre chests of treasure and stuff. Yes. So, that's, yeah. A, oh, yeah. that's a bit more abstract, right? But then they, they kind of messed it up because then they have this whole conversion table of, okay... Six oh, fists make boy. one bag. Five bags make one chest. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Uh, At that point, okay. you're doing accounting again. Because <clears throat> th at that point, yes. why not just use copper, silver, and stuff we know? Yeah. It'll have the same effect. I think, anyway. I mean, I will say, on the character sheet, it just gives you as many slots uh, for things as you just said. So right. there are five slots for handfuls, yeah. and then the sixth one... Um, would turn it into a bag, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I, it seems pretty intuitive, but I see what you mean. It is, but it's also, it's just more fiddly than I expected. Yeah. If you're going to mm -hmm. go ahead and make it abstract because you don't want to nickel and dime everything, yeah. then, then just make it non-fiddly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe well, just a, a single scale or but, whatever. But okay. Didn't you, last time we talked about this, didn't you 
uh, talk about how the DM and the player want something extremely different from uh, money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I talked about that in the video I made, uh, the, oh, the, yeah. the Daggerheart video. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's just my experience that uh, DMs tend to like this because it's easier to plan uh, yeah. and uh, players hate it. Yeah, maybe to have this abstract is, money. Maybe this is uh, the path. Maybe. The, the way right in the middle. <laughs> I do think it would be, yeah, Daggerheart seems to be right in the middle on many things. Um, I do think it would be super cool if you show up with an actual uh, little bag of fake gold and you throw mm -hmm. that at players and that, that might work really well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think then they would like it. Uh -huh. Oh, God. It might, oh. <laughs> you know these chocolate dollars? Yeah. That's, oh, God, that I know. So Are those cool. still around? Do uh, they still? I know them from probably. my childhood. I, I'm pretty sure they don't go bad. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it's full of conservative <laughs> yeah. uh, ingredients. So they probably made like a billion of them at one yeah. point, and then they didn't know what to do with them. I mean, we still they still exist. Somewhere. The thing is, though, even if money uh, would be uh, an easy to use system, uh, it wouldn't matter because none of the items in the game have prices associated with them. And there's uh, no okay. guide on uh, how to come up with prices. Yeah, um, that that sounds like something um, they just get to at some point. And have yeah, they, they say it's deliberate, right? They say it's so oh, okay. it, it doesn't impede the narrative or whatever. I'm being a bit mean now, I know, but that they I, I don't know the exact wording. It's something like that. Hmm. And I, I don't know if they're going to stick to that. Um, it's just so weird, right? Because all these choices... Um, would make so much more sense if then the entire character creation and combat stuff wasn't so um, wargamey. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If yeah. they just threw that as well and make it a totally narrative game, then that's all that's what stuff, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, the the reward cycle to me that's actually so bad that it doesn't. It makes me not excited to play it. Like I, I wouldn't know how to. Either DM it or play it. Mm. I can't get excited about that. But then, of course, I think, okay, how would you hack that? Because <laughs> it's like the the game isn't designing that part of itself. And it mm -hmm. also tells you everywhere, make it your own. Uh, you know, don't let anything impede your fun. And then, okay, I guess that's just part of the system that you have to design part of it yourself. You know, maybe it's a toolbox for you to come up with an actual RPG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. I, I would it sounds like I'm slamming it, but maybe, maybe that's where it is. I mean, the thing is, I don't want like a toolbox. I I'd <laughs> rather have a framework to work on. Yeah. Um, that that's a that's what I think of yeah. when I uh, or what I think of there is something like stuff without numbers. Yeah, which uh, at least is a complete game. In yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can play that yeah. without any homebrew, and it works fine. And even if you do homebrew whatever you want it still works fine and you can't basically break it and it's great <clears throat> and okay. this feels uh, yeah um so i have a not finished or not not um completed point but I'm, yeah. it's still open beta um it is the open beta i have a, a final closing question uh for you vincent mm -hmm. um if you had to dm dagger heart tomorrow yes. or let's say next week whatever you can prepare okay, um, you had me scared that far <laughs> <laughs> well actually i have some people right now <laughs> who would like to play with you here's mushroom person number one okay that I, kind I, of stuff. the thing is i feel like i could probably do it <laughs> oh sure i mean you have experience as well yeah. and um, but this also like it feels um it feels like a game you could easily play yeah the core mechanic is solid and easily yeah. understandable uh, and I think that's a big strength, right? Mm -hmm. That's That keeps me excited about this game too yeah. because right now, in my opinion, 5th edition has the crown for like entry-level drug, right? Um, <laughs> the yes. thing you use to get normal people hooked on RPGs. Uh -huh. Yes, I think, you did 20. Yeah. You're oh, I know this from good nerds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> oh, I know this from nerds. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> that's a I great tagline. <laughs> <laughs> episode title yeah. <laughs> <There you go>. uh -huh. <laughs> uh, 
maybe from Big Bang Theory or whatever, but like fifth edition is good at this, right? It gives players lots of options. It's not too overbearing with the rules, but it also introduces you to having structured conversations with rules and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it does a great job of getting people into RPGs. Yeah. Um, but it also has its downsides and it's a little bit, it's just a bit old by now and yeah. I'm okay with having something fresh. Like, <laughs> sorry. But my experience with fifth edition is it works fine for new players yeah. as long as you don't introduce spells. <laughs> yeah, and as and long as they don't get too high level, right? Yeah, and it gets uh -huh. tedious and stuff. And it's just, in my, my opinion, it's just um, not that great to DM, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just a bit, whatever, but that's fifth, fifth edition. Yeah. My question was, how would you DM Daggerheart and how would you hack the experience system, right? How, what would you give the XP for? So my question is predicated on, okay, you don't play it as written, you hack yeah. the XP system in some way. How would you do it? Hmm. Good question. Um, so my natural instinct is uh, surprisingly to to play it a bit like West Marches. Uh -huh. um, because what, what does that mean to you? Um, so very much focused on exploration, like a hex crawler, basically. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just because that's apparently where my mind goes to if I think. Yeah, I love hex crawlers. I love exploration. <laughs> yes, Daggerheart uh, gives you nothing for that. And then the, uh, the XP or the, the the milestone would be if the, if the players interact with the dungeon in some way. So either clear it or reach the next level, for example. Uh huh. Um. But yeah, something like that. I uh, don't right. know the specifics, but that's... But like engaging dungeons or points of interest in an overworld that they get to Yeah, explore. and at achieving uh, or overcoming a challenge in that regard. <clears throat> okay. And yeah, that's usually tables can agree on what constitutes a challenge and whatnot. Yeah, but this was also fun, Vincent. I, I enjoy this Daggerheart discussion. Me yeah, too. It's I also, very intense. Yeah, it's really interesting. Or the, that one shot really um, was interesting because um, seeing the difference between what, in my opinion, the, the players and the GM really want to play and what this game is becoming. Or has become, yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm curious how it develops if, if it goes more into the direction of what I think the players want, uh, or if it keeps this uh, the gameplay of something akin to D and D. Yeah, I'm curious. They said that, um, uh, or let me put it this way: I'm excited to see um, th like n the next iteration of it. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. they said that Definitely. in the open beta. Um, they might release new uh, materials and stuff, and you need to check back. And they have that wonderful change lock at the top of the document. So, yeah. so also, uh, who knows w where it will go? Curious to see how much they're actually willing to change. Yeah. Right, if it's just yeah. um, small differences from edition to edition, or if it's... Uh, I've read a comment somewhere where they yeah. said, um, yeah, it's mostly done. We're just looking at the balancing and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, well... Uh, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. Let, let me ask you this: Would Would you want to play it in this? Uh, would you want to play this version of Daggerheart? Uh, as I said, I would play it provided that I hack in some kind of XP reward mechanic. Okay. And that's my condition. Without that, in mm -hmm. its just its raw form, I wouldn't want to play it. But just because of that aspect, right? Yeah. There's no reward. The other stuff, I'm totally fine if that's not quite um, fleshed out. Hmm. Yeah. Right? It's yeah, I'd, cool I'd... enough, the, the fear and hope, mm -hmm. passing back and forth the turns, the cool character creation, the domain cards. It's all cool toys to play with. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, the, the XP thing would need a hack, and everything else seems fine for the moment. Yeah. And then... Probably then, yeah. gets changed uh, yeah. while playing because 
that's how we play game. <laughs> no, absolutely. And the game tells you to do that, right? And yeah. that's fine. Uh -huh. I know already one of the hacks I would make is like um, write a bunch of tables for me as the DM so I don't have to make decisions on what to spend fear on, right? And mm -hmm. I can just roll. Okay, this now uh, someone loses a bad condition of my guys and now um, someone gets extra damage and stuff. You can just let the dice decide. Right? Mm -hmm. And then all that yeah. antagonism, I don't want to make decisions stuff is fixed. Yeah, and, sounds good. Um, yeah, yeah. But, oh, well, uh, we'll see um, where it goes. We'll see if we talk more about Daggerheart next week. I guess it depends on if there's news about it. Uh, other than that, um, maybe we'll talk about it when we actually play it. Yes. Should it come to that. Yeah. Um, all right, Vincent, I'd say we call it here. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the A Dungeon About podcast. We record live usually every Thursday at 4 p.m. Central European time on Twitch, twitch.tv slash he makes me play underscore live. You can also watch some of our Let's Plays and other videos we create on the He Makes Me Play YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash at he makes me play. And you can also follow us on Twitter at makes underscore play. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. have a lot of freedom but as spider-man tells us with great freedom also comes great responsibility that's not what he, that's not what he said and that's no? not who, sa who said it <laughs> well as spider-man that's, does, that's so. his his uncle ben <laughs> is telling spider-man with great power comes great responsibility yeah i was <laughs> sort of close though <laughs> I mean, I guess sort of like Daggerheart is close to it D&D. It was <laughs> like almost half the same words <laughs> and a character from the same show or comic yeah, book. That's true. <laughs> I'm really ballparking. Uh -huh. Yeah, it. no, this is yeah. fine.